In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, good morning. Where does the time go? We have only one week of great Lent left to us, and then begins Holy Week. So we have one week left of normal fast, and then we have a really challenging fast. And a lot of beautiful opportunities to come and to hear all the divine services of the church. It's been said, rightly said, that it is really not possible to understand the Orthodox Christian faith without having experienced really the, the fullness of Holy Week. Because so much of what animates us as an Orthodox Christian people is contained in these services of Great and Holy Week. And so we're going to hear a lot of beautiful hymnology. We're going to hear a lot of beautiful readings and be inspired, I think, and convicted in our hearts to follow Jesus Christ more closely. And on Tuesday evening, we're going to hear a beautiful hymn called the Hymn of St. Cassiani. So called because it was St. Cassiani who composed the hymn. And it's a beautiful hymn that speaks to us about deep and real repentance, which is, of course, the aim of the entire Lenten season and Holy Week, so that when we get to the light of Pascha and say for the first time, Christ is risen, Christos Anesti, we can do so without any sin or darkness in our hearts. And this beautiful hymn of Cassiani tells a story, an account of something that occurred in the life of Christ in the days leading up to his life-giving and voluntary passion that is recorded for us in the seventh chapter of St. Luke's Gospel. It is a story of a sinful woman who comes and makes kind of a spectacle of herself at a dinner of a man who considered himself to be righteous. This is what St. Luke writes. He says, Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume, and standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and kept wiping them with her hair of her head, and kissing his feet, and anointing them with perfume. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And so this beautiful hymn of St. Cassiani, which we will be hearing from our cathedral choir this Holy Tuesday, and in fact this hymn is conducted, actually composed rather, by Father Michael Pallet of our sister church in Peoria, gives us this account, this amazing sort of account of this woman who burst into a meal for which she was not invited so that she could pour out her repentance on the feet of Christ. Now, as you can imagine, the people there were indignant. How dare she come into our private gathering? She, who is it worthy, really, to be with this Christ figure? And so Jesus, knowing what they're saying, hearing it, and more than that, as God, peering into their hearts, says the following. He said to them, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. When the Lord tells us he has something to say to us, we should listen very carefully. And this is what he says. He says, a certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, and the other one 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. Which of them, therefore, will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You've judged correctly. And then Jesus, turning to the woman, says to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But she, since I time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins which are many have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. To the one who has been forgiven much comes much love. To the one who has been given little 
comes little love. It's an important and a basic premise. And I'm reminded of this especially today as we consider the story of St. Mary of Egypt. This wretched sinner became an amazing saint. And we hear her story perhaps every year, but every year it's good to be reminded. St. Mary of Egypt was born in the year 344 in Alexandria in Egypt. She was raised by parents that by the age of 13 she got tired of and left. So from the age of 13 to 30, she was employed in what we call the world's oldest profession. She worked the streets of Alexandria, but to say that she worked is a bit of a misnomer because she was more of a volunteer. She didn't get paid. She had a terrible sexual addiction. And so for 17 years, she described herself later, a year before she died, to St. Zosimus, what kind of a person she was and how deplorable she had become. We've been reading in this Lenten season from the books of Genesis and Isaiah and Proverbs. And the wisdom of Solomon in the Proverbs describes this kind of person in tremendous detail. And this is what he says about these type of people. He says the following in Proverbs chapter 7, describing something that he had seen. For at the window of my house I looked out through my lattice, and I saw among the naive, I discerned among the youth, a young man lacking sense, passing through the steep street near her corner. And he takes away to her house in the twilight in the evening, in the middle of the night, in the darkness, and behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot of cunning heart. She is boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She is now in the streets, now in the squares, and lurks by every corner. And she seizes him and kisses him. And with a brazen face, she says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings. Today I have paid my vows. And if you understand that, that's kind of explicit. Therefore I have come out to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly, and I have found you. And I have spread my couch with coverings, with colored linens of Egypt, and I have sprinkled my bed with myrrh and olives and cinnamon. Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves in caresses. And she goes on and on and on, saying, because my husband isn't home. So it's safe to come over. At the end, Solomon says this, Now therefore, my sons, listen to me, and pay attention to the words of my mouth. <clears throat> Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many are the victims she has cast down, and numerous are her slain. Her house is the way to Sheol, descending to the chambers of death. And you may think that reading the Bible is boring. I promise you it is most certainly not, but this is the kind of woman that St. Mary of Egypt described herself to be, to the Lord Jesus Christ. The sinful woman in St. John's Gospel were not entirely 100% sure who she was. Some people say Mary of Bethany. That makes the most sense. Non-Orthodox say perhaps Mary of Mary Magdalene, but we don't believe that was the case. Almost certainly she was a woman who was cast down at the feet of Jesus with the accuser standing around her saying, Master, she deserves death because we caught her in the very act of adultery. We caught her and she deserves to die. Mary Magdalene, this woman Mary, perhaps of Bethany, perhaps another Mary, perhaps someone altogether different because again, the scriptures aren't entirely clear who she was, was this kind of person described by Solomon in Proverbs. Mary described herself as a predator. And when she was approaching 30 years of age, there was a pilgrimage taking place from Alexandria just a little east to Jerusalem because the Holy Cross of Christ was being venerated on the Feast of the Cross in September, and so she decided out of curiosity, a vain and a, and a simple woman, that she would go. She had no money. She couldn't afford the fare. So she promised the crew that she would make herself useful to them on the passage. 
And so she finds herself with a crowd of people rushing from the port and heading toward Jerusalem. And she goes up with them in the crowd and she begins to try to enter the church and she's stopped by an invisible force. You can imagine if that were the case for us, I'd never get into the church. So she stops and she tries again and again and realizes that it is the course of her life It is a sin in her life that is preventing her from being able even to enter into the church itself. And so she goes to the porch and there's a fountain and an icon of the Virgin Mary and she begins to break. Beloved, if we're not yet broken before Christ, we are not yet on the path that will lead us to heaven. If we've not yet been broken, we haven't even started our journey. But she's broken. And so she sits and she weeps. She's tired of the way she's been living. She's tired of the mockery she's made of her life. And so the Virgin Mary speaks to her and says, if you flee into the desert, you will find peace. And then she's able to enter the church with God's help. She venerates the Holy Cross of Christ, wiping her own face with her tears, weeping, lamenting bitterly, She leaves the church and she finds a couple loaves of bread and she goes into the desert of Sinai for 37 years. And she describes the torment she went through in those 37 years trying to break that spirit of lust within her. Battling her passions. So that by the time Zosimus finds her, he sees her, for instance, in prayer, rising off the ground. He sees her running across the surface of the river. When she sees him, she greets him by name and knows the name of all the brothers in his monastery and the abbot, knows all of their issues. It's quoting to him lengthy passages of Holy Scripture that she's never read in her life. So sanctified, so Christified had she become in those 37 years, weeping for the 17 that she'd wasted prior. And because she was forgiven much, she loved much. Now, we might say for ourselves, well, Father, do I have to go and and sin like that in order to love Jesus more? It's a question that St. Paul asked in the Romans. Should we sin more so that grace can abound more to us? And he said, absolutely not. But we need to begin to understand that the measure of our love for Jesus Christ is predicated upon the measure of our repentance, our confession, our willingness, the courage to come to grips with our sin. Now we may say, I don't really sin that much, Father. I think I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good about myself. I'm a good guy. I pay my taxes. I stop at stop signs. Come to church now and again. You know, I can say about myself, you know... Hey, I'm a priest, right? I mean, got a big cross. Pretty cool. Got one of these. It's great. I get to stand in front of the altar. I pray all the time. And I can be perfectly religious in every way and really impress you with how religious I am, but where is my heart? Am I willing to weep over my sins? Am I willing to come to grips with the things in my life that need amendment, that need correction, that need healing? St. John, in his first epistle, describes for us the danger if we play games. We had the joy the last three Saturdays to hear about 40 confessions of people coming to the church to be cleansed, to get themselves right with God, to clear their accounts. Would that we had 40 more, and even more than that, St. John says the following, he says, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then this beautiful verse, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So how can we come to love God more? Is it possible for us, like the sinful woman, like Mary, to sit at his feet and to wet 
his feet with her tears. If you have long hair, I suppose to dry his feet with your hair. To kiss and reverence his feet. We'll have an opportunity in Holy Week, on Holy Thursday evening, during the Passion Gospel service, when we process the cross of Christ around the church in complete darkness, lit only by your candles. We'll come around, we'll place the cross of Christ here in the Soleil, and we'll invite each of you to come up and to venerate the icon of Christ upon the cross. You'll have an opportunity to kiss his feet and to weep your own tears, mine, for our sins. And by doing so, we'll find that our love for Christ grows. When I realize how amazingly he has saved me from my sins that I commit every day of my life, every hour of my life, the things that I do and don't do and think, my intentions. I might seem pretty cool. I've got these nice clothes. I've got a cross. I've got one of these. But I want to love Jesus more. And so I have to repent more. And in his mercy, what does he say to us? As he says to the woman at his feet, Woman, where are thine accusers? Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. He says of Mary of Bethany that what she has done in anointing him would be an everlasting memorial for her. So beloved, in these last few days, one week, and then Palm Sunday next week for us, and then Holy Week, we have this blessed opportunity to deepen our love for Jesus Christ by repenting, by confessing. So may we find the grace and the courage to do that. May we emulate the courage of St. Mary of Egypt and pour out our confession to Christ. Amen.